Hey, everybody. Welcome back. We've got Greg Barlow from East Tennessee State University up next. He's going to be talking about how you can animate smarter tools, trip tips, and tricks for faster and better animation production. Uh, with that, I'll, it's all yours, Greg. Hmm. It's, a, it's, a, it's a tongue twister. So, hey, everybody. Um, welcome to um, what what Jay just said, uh, animation, a, animate smarter tools, tips, and tricks for faster and better animation production. And I'll be honest with you, um, we are going to focus in mostly on the faster part. Um, about this is this is uh, about efficiency and uh, and and being able to create animations like sort of on a time budget. So. Um, First of me, I always like to start off any of my talks um, with uh, a, a little introduction of like who I am, why, why you should care, like what, what, what I'm saying. Um, so uh, I have a couple of these slides. The first one, you know, again, Gregory Marlowe, I'm, I'm an assistant professor at uh, East Tennessee State University. I'm seeing a couple of uh, familiar names in the chat here from, uh, from ETSU too. Um, I, I may actually just be giving this talk to my uh, to my current animation class. <laughs> I'm not sure, um, but uh, at, at ETSU we uh, we have a couple of things. We we have a bachelor's of science program in digital media, and um, how we define digital media is um, four concentrations. We have animation, uh, game design, visual effects, and visualization. And very, very soon, hopefully, um, we are expecting to also have an MFA um, in digital media. We are expecting that approval to, to come uh, in mid-May, and um, we will be able to start accepting a first uh, class for that MFA program in the fall of 2021. So, <laughs> um, so who else am I? My, my alter ego. Um, I'm also Greg Marlowe, the animator. Um, I've been working in the uh, video game industry for about 12 years now. Um, I uh, worked in-house at Firaxis Games for about five years, and um, uh, and I've worked on uh, quite a few games um, from from the uh, Civilization franchise, uh, Civilization Five and Six, uh, the XCOM franchise, and then. Uh, after I started teaching, I also continued to do um, a reasonable amount of uh, freelance animation work, uh, some for some indie studios, some for some some pretty big studios like uh, um, Gearbox. I worked on Battleborn, and uh, most recently I worked on uh, The Pathless, which was uh, um, a PlayStation 5 uh, launch title. Um, and um, so I, I still animate, and right? I'm still creating animations um, quite a bit. Um, so let's get this talk started with some relatively arbitrary facts about Greg. Um, I really like to read. Um, I, I love um, fiction, mainly uh, uh, science fiction, fantasy, um, other speculative fiction. But um, I'm also a really slow reader. Um, so at some point I started to realize as I was getting older, I only have so many years uh, left in my life to read everything ever written. And, um, and, and so if I wanted to get it all read, I needed to learn how to read a little faster. So um, the reason I'm, I'm a, a slow reader is because of this word, subvocalization. Um, so uh, so subvocalization is the internal speech in, that you hear in your head when you're, when you're reading silently. And uh, some people in this talk are, um, are are probably like, "What are you talking about?" And that's because they don't sub vocalize um, when they uh, when they read. They you know they just they just read through the words and they're not reading it out loud in their head. Um, so, and if that's the the case, then that means they probably read much faster than I do. Um, so the word so sub vocalization is a, a good example of the problem, right? So if you if you say it out loud, sub vocalization, right? it's like six syllables. Like it it takes a little while to say it, right? Um, like it takes almost a whole second just to say the word sub vocalization. Um, 
so if you are pronouncing that entire word in your head while you read, it slows you down, right? It slows, it slows down how long it takes you to get to the next word. People who don't subvocalize, right? They, they just see this very long word, understand what it means, and they immediately go on to the next word. And it saves them a, a fraction of a second for every word that they read. And it means that they can read more quickly, right? So um, I, I've, I've done this all my life. I sub-vocalize when I'm reading. I'm reading every sentence out loud in my head, and that slows down how many words I can read per minute. So um, I wanted to work on this. So I downloaded an app um, that helps train you to read faster. Um, and what this app does is it, it flashes words at your face faster than you can comfortably read, right? Uh, fa faster than you read naturally. Um, meaning that I don't have time to sub-vocalize before it goes on to the next word, right? And so if I want to be able to read and understand this, I have to train myself to not sub-vocalize. So when I first started doing this, I was reading probably about 250 words a minute. And um, after doing this for about a year or so, I'm up to about 300 to 350 words per minute. If it's if it's written pretty um, uh, intuitively or casually, um, you know, academic writing is a little bit slower still yet. And um, and also I, I read audiobooks while I work. So that lets me um, get in even more reading, uh, you know, for, for, for every hour of my day, right? Um, so here's why I tie it back in. Uh, using a couple of tools, tips, and tricks, um, now I can read faster, right? So... This talk is about animating smarter, right? And I really, again, I wish I had titled this Animate Faster, but I think that, um, well, we, there are hundreds of talks out there about how to animate better. Um, you can see my previous talks or my future ECGC talks. They will also be about how to animate better. This talk is about animating smarter, and that means reducing waste, increasing your animation speed, and being more productive when you animate. So I, I, this is this needs to be said. If you are a bad animator, if you if you are making like you know poor quality animations, and you have not taken the time to learn what makes animations good, this talk will not make your bad animations better. Um, it will just make make you'll just help you make bad animations faster and more <laughs> more efficiently. Um, you still need to study the 12 principles and practice making, you know, crafting good motion. Um, however, if, if you're still learning, if you're still learning how to make higher quality animations, uh, what this will do is it will still help you be more efficient. And hopefully that means that you'll improve in your quality more efficiently as well, right? Um, you're not wasting time in, in, in the, the, the process of learning. So, so now that's understood, let's go ahead and talk about how to animate smarter. And let's start with where we where we start with a lot of things, which is our workflow, right? Um, workflow for animation. You start an animation and you work on it and then it's finished, right? Like, um, actually I see a question. I, I don't remember the name of the app right now off the off the top of my head, but if you just search speed reading and most of the app stores, there's, there's several similar apps. Um, animation workflow isn't, like, isn't this simple, right? It's not just like, we're just making animations all day happily. Like, game productions are not predictable. Um, and one of the things that will have probably the biggest impact on your animation efficiency and speed um, is to make sure that you're dedicating time to working on the correct animations, right? Uh, nothing is a bigger waste of time than working forever on something that the player never ends up seeing, right? The, the project workflow that minimizes waste will free up time uh, for you to work on other pieces. So a, a, a preface on this section, um, every studio has a slightly different pipeline depending on the kind of project you're making. And so I'm not saying that this is the only workflow or this is exactly how every project should be structured. What I'm saying is that every project should have a workflow discussion. Right, you, you need to under the, the entire project needs to know how um, to best utilize the limited number of animation hours you have uh, to put into the project, and the team should you know sort of all be part of that conversation on how to determine what is the best way to not waste the animator's time. Right? 
Um, so this is this is a, a very simplified version of most of the workflows that I've seen that work really well. Um, so there's three phases. And the first phase is a stub animation, right? This is for testing for gameplay purposes to see if your animation is even going to stay in the game, right? I need to reiterate, this is not your blocking pass, right? You're not focusing on crafting beautiful poses. You are making something to put into the game to see if the game functions, right? Um, my rule of thumb for stub animations is if it's taking longer than 15 minutes, you're wasting time. Make it quick, export it to the game, right? And um, then the programmers, the art directors, the designers, um, e even you, like you can test it. You can see the animation um, in its gameplay um, state and see if it's even necessary, right? Um, if it's not animation, or if, I'm sorry, if it's not necessary, then um, you've only lost 15 minutes of work, right? If you if you had worked on this for days, you'd cry yourself to sleep that night, right? Um, so phase two, if the animation is a necessary animation, then you get the animation up to a quality that um, I've always heard termed shippable, right? <laughs> that means, um, you block it out, you spline it to a reasonable amount, you, you know, you put whatever polish you feel is necessary to not embarrass yourself and the team if this game had to ship tomorrow, right? Um, so then after you get it up to shippable quality, of course, you export it again, and um, we, we get it into the game. And, and now you have what, it, what should be a fully shippable animation in the game as you play it. Um, most, um, most animation productions, like there's a, a, a phase in the process that, or a phase in the, uh, the, um, the schedule for polish, right? And this is this bank of time that you keep borrowing from throughout the entire production to say, oh, well, we'll just work on this a little longer and your polish time gets smaller and smaller. So, um, with all of these shippable animations, you have to kind of pick your battles, right? Um, if there is some time left later on in the production or at the end or you know on a weekend or something, um, which animations is it going to really impact the game if you if you put additional polish on them, right? And so for the polish layer, um, like you just need to recognize that not everything, like frankly, deserves that polish pass, right? A, a character that's like, you know, half a mile away um, that you never see any closer, right? Doesn't have to have polish on the pinky fingers, right? Like you, 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 you kind of pick your battles and, um, and you, uh, you polish the things that you, that are going to make the most impact, right? Don't polish the stuff that's in the background that nobody's only going to see, you know, everybody's only going to see once polish the stuff that is front and center and is going to play over and over again. Like these are your babies. And, and for these, you, you make them shine. Uh, this is where you can put an extravagant amount of detail into it. And, uh, and then again, we export it in the game and uh, you're out of time. You got to ship this thing. Right. Um, so I'll show you some sort of examples of this. This is something um, I, I did in, in, in a class, actually some, some of you maybe were in that class. Um, where we just needed to test out a gameplay uh, um, animation set, right? A, a run, a jump, and a, an idle. Um, and we needed to get the blueprint and everything set up first. And so we just needed some stub animations to actually see if um, what we were doing in terms of the, uh, the state machine was even working, right? These didn't need to be good. They needed to be a functionality test, right? And so literally, I think that when we were doing these in class, I said, spend less than a minute on each of them. Right? We just need something with the legs kicking. So we understand, um, so we understand what is uh, like when we hit the, 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 the up arrow, is it playing the run animation or is it not playing the run animation, right? Um, after we get all the functionality working and all of the, the timing worked out, right, then we can spend a little bit more time on polishing this animation, right? And this is, 
you know, actually, I would say this is probably just shy of shippable. There's still some stuff that could use some work on this. Um, but this is something that has a little bit more time put into it to where, um, you know, we're, we're, we're thinking about arcs, we're thinking about overlapping action. And, uh, and the time invested in this, I was confident was going to end up in the game, right? So it wasn't wasted time. Um, you know, this is a simple example of it, but there are much more complicated examples. So this is, um, this is from the Pathless. This is a, a project I worked on um, with Giant Squid Studios. Um, and this character, I, I was, uh, my primary uh, focus was on the, uh, the boss battle uh, fights for the creatures, right? And I can I can't remember this character's name in the the the, uh, the the lore of the story, but we just internally called it the Hydra because it could have up to seven heads, um, and those heads were procedural, right? We we didn't know which head the player would shoot first, right? And um, and all of these animations had to work whether the character had seven heads or whether the character had one head, right? And so it, it took a long time to create any specific attack sequence for this character because of that, right? When when the head would swing, we had to make sure the other heads would get out of the way. A whole bunch of interesting stuff happening in this. And um, and this boss changed multiple times, right? The, the way, like, we would, we would prototype stuff, we would play the game, and... Um, and certain attacks wouldn't work as well, right? We'd be like, oh, let's try it different. And, and if you if you play the game, actually the entire third phase of this boss battle is a completely different uh, situation. Like the camera changes and everything. It has a whole entirely different animation set. Um, it, and this only would have worked if we were testing all of this gameplay mechanics, if the boss battle is even fun. Um, it only works if we're testing that with animations we can do quickly and not feel guilty about throwing away, right? Um, so the uh, the phrase that I'm sure you've all heard before, perfect is the enemy of done. Um, it's actually, this is often misquoted. It's, a, it's commonly attributed to Voltaire, uh, who actually said something to the effect of perfectly is the, perfect is the enemy of good. Um, but I think it's all still the same, the same thing. Um, no one will get to marvel at your amazing animations if you don't ship the game. Um, you're spending forever polishing in tiny details um, on one animation, and that means other animations may not even make it into the game at all because you ran out of time. Um, so let's assume you have all of this pipeline stuff behind you, and like you're you're ready to start animating. You're like, all right, I, I know I know what to do. Um, so. Now you're ready to start uh, setting keyframes. Um, let's talk about some some tools, right? Um, in fact, most of this talk is about tools um, in some way or another. So Maya, Blender, Max, they're all great programs, um, despite what the meme battles have to say about it. Um, but out of the box, there are, there are always things that can be improved. There are features that you know, that aren't, that you would love to have that aren't in those programs. And uh, thankfully, there are a lot of people out there who are making custom tools um, that, that make your life uh, easier. And some of those tools are free. Um, so let's talk about a few of those. This one's one that um, every animator should be using in some way or another, uh, which is a breakdown tool. And in this case, I'm referring, uh, this, this version is the tween machine. So we have two keyframes pose A and pose B. And the tween machine just allows you to set a breakdown key um, in between there um, that favors either pose A or pose B. And the point of this is by setting these breakdown keys, we're able to um, adjust easing, we're able to uh, put in some automatic overshoot, we're able to ease in and out, um, and we're able to adjust the timing and the spacing of our actions much more quickly. Um, there's a whole lot of different uh, versions of, of these types of tools, um, but probably the most commonly used because it's free is, is the Tween Machine. Um, Tween Machine is, I think, uh, it's either Creative Commons or, or uh, open source now, um, written by Justin Barrett, and then Justin Barrett uh, turned it over to, to a guy named Alex Widener. Um, who, who now maintains it. And you can just go to a GitHub and, and download it, but it's an extremely beneficial tool. Um, 
Another tool is a rotation order tool. So rotation order will cause very weird gimbal issues to happen, right? Like we're trying to get our character to do a flip. We get these, these little wonky uh, flips in the middle of it or, or waves in the middle of it. And all of that is based off of our rotation order. And so this rotation order tool will alter your rotation order to the one that will have the least amount of issues, um, which is something you can do manually in Maya anyway. Um, what this does that's very beneficial is if you just change that in Maya, you you lose all of that animation information. It, it, it Now all of those keyframes mean something different. And uh, what this does is it changes your rotation order and then bakes the keyframes back onto the to the rig um, in the uh, in the correct uh, like world orientation, right? Um, and these are free tools. In fact, this is this is a Creative Commons license. Um, if you just search, it's, I think it's uh, 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 Morgan Loomis is the, the person who released it, and it's just an incredible tool that will save you hours of time because without this you would just be manually keyframing every frame of the animation to get this to work correctly. Um, another tool that is extremely beneficial and free is uh, Studio Library. Studio Library is um, it's a pose library is what it is. Uh, so you can create poses on your character's face or your character's hand or even the entire character's body and save those in this library that you can quickly dial in in order to repeat that pose, right? And, and I think most people use it mostly for, for facial animation um, because there's some very, uh, some common poses, but other, other ways that you can use this, this is a tool that you can share across a team. And so that means you could share an entire library of idle poses for a character or an entire library of hand poses for a character um, that you could quickly dial in and try out on the character. Um, again, it's a it's a tool that is um, completely free to use. So, um, so um, tools can save you a lot of time. It's worth investing the time now into uh, into those tools. Uh, stockpiling links of things um, you think you may that may help you or have a reasonable understanding of them. Uh, because you need that when you need to use them, right? Otherwise, when you encounter gimbal lock, you're not going to, you know, you're going to be less likely to go out and try to find a tool and then learn how to use that tool and then use the tool to solve your problem. Um, you're just going to sort of brute force, um, you know, slog your way through gimbal lock and, and waste time, right? If you learn how to use that tool now, when gimbal lock comes up, you'll just use the tool and fix it and uh, you know, put, put the tools in your toolbox where you can use them when you need them. Right? Um, so again, there's, there's lots of great free tools out there. Um, some tools, however, are not free, right? Um, so stop being cheap and buy it, right? Get, uh, get the tools that will, will help you uh, be better at your job. So, uh, if your company or your client will pay for it, that's great. If not, buy it yourself. And here's how you can justify buying it yourself. Take whatever your hourly rate is. Take whatever it is you're, you're charging or getting paid, right? Um, and then ask yourself, how many hours of work will this plug in? Um, I, I, how many uh, of your hours and at that hourly rate does this plug in cost, right? And then how many hours will it save you? And so I'll give you an example of this. Uh, Advanced Skeleton is a an, an incredible. I'm, <laughs> I'm not getting paid by any of these <laughs> these companies, by the way. This is I'm not a sales rep or anything like that. These are just tools that are that are valuable and, and good examples of this uh, that I that, that should should be in everybody's workflow. So Advanced Skeleton is an auto rigging tool um, where you can rig an entire character. Uh, that is game ready, including a face rig, in somewhere between two to four hours after you after you sort of learn how to use the the tool, right? Um, it's it's kind of expensive though. I mean, there's a free version of it you can use if you're a student or just you know just playing around with it. But if you're going to make license, if you're a freelance, license is seven hundred and fifty dollars, and a studio license is two thousand dollars. So the question to ask yourself is like, how many hours? does it take to rig a character, right? Like if you were gonna rig this character from scratch, like could you do it in 80 hours, right? Um, I, I don't know, like, I mean, I don't know that I could make a 
particularly great rig from scratch in 80 hours. Um, maybe I'm sure that there are people out there who could. Um, but then you have to ask yourself, like, what is the hourly rate you're charging? And I'm not suggesting that $25 an hour is the hourly rate you should be charging. But if it were, 80 hours at $25 an hour is $2,000. And I'm sure that number might sound familiar from two lines above, right? Um, it makes it worth it. Um, I see there's a there's a question down there. Um, can you? Uh, so we'll, we'll get back to to some of the questions at the end, um, uh, Jacob. So, um, so, um, so let's talk about another one, Animbot. Uh, this when I, I I was talking to a friend uh, through text uh, earlier and telling him I was I was going to be doing an animation talk, um, and I was going to be talking about some animation tools. And, um, and he just replied back, Animbot is life. Um, <laughs> like animators, like this is, I, 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 don't, I don't want the person who writes this tool to ever know how valuable it is for me. Um, because right now, I, it basically costs me somewhere between 60 to $396 a year, depending on which license I get. Uh, I think I'm actually paying somewhere in the middle of about $110 a year. Um, and I, I cannot estimate the value of this tool enough. It has saved me countless number of hours. So I'm just going to show you a couple of the features that uh, that I use in this and why it's why it's worth it. Um, it also has a, a breakdown tool um, that allows like for easing and favoring of keys. This is very similar to what we were looking at with a tween machine, right? You find a, a spot that you want your breakdown key and you can sort of favor the previous or the next key, right? Um, but it also has options to let you simplify or bake um, keys into a curve, right? So this is my translate Y, which is my up and down. Um, I can uh, quickly throw a whole bunch more keys on that curve, and I can throw some wave or noise uh, information on that curve, right? Um, and, and so there's just a whole slew of new, uh, of, of ways to work with, uh, with multiple like volumes of keys, right? Like if I want to grab a whole bunch of them, I can manipulate um, volumes of keys at one time. So an example of this is, let's say you get some particularly noisy motion capture data. Um, it's got some uh, features that will allow us to, um, to smooth that data, um, just kind of uh, sort of smooth it out. Um, or if we just want to completely rework this and change the easing, um, of this, I can actually grab sections of keys and uh, blend what is currently there to a little bit more of an ease, or I can just completely change all of those keys and generate an ease in or an ease out in all of those keys, right? Um, so this is tools like this are particularly handy if you are using, you know, you know, leveraging a bunch of motion capture data, but also just if you've already animated a bunch of your animation and you've manually put a lot of keys in there. So um, something I also find really useful in this tool is um, the chance to to make a, uh, a quick uh, quick selection sets as a form of a button. So there's a little built-in GUI where you can have your, your character and select all of the character or just an arm or just a leg. Uh, but really the benefit of this is you can make these really quickly. You can make these on the fly and so, you know, if you're just in a section of the animation where you're working on the index finger, you can quickly make an index finger button that will grab all of the controls for the index finger, right? Um, and of course, this is something you can do inside of Maya without this, right, without this tool. Um, this just makes that way quicker and more efficient, right, which is what this talk is about. Um, something I use quite a bit is these temporary pivot points. So let's say I was going to have this character do a flip, right? It's very easy to translate the character, but once I start rotating it, right, we get it really starts messing up my pose, right? Um, what I can do instead is uh, with those objects selected, I can make a temporary pivot point for all of them, um, move that uh, to a different location, and then just rotate all of them around that pivot point, right? Um, this is really good for uh, transposing your idle poses for like a, a turn animation. Um, let's say your, your character has to do a 90 degree turn. Um, it's, it's harder than you would think it is or should be 
just to get your character in that same idle pose turned 90 degrees, right? Uh, this tool allows you to do it in just a, a second, right? Um, and really, I think one of the big time savers of this tool is this thing right here, the Anim Recovery Tool. Uh, actually, when, when this tool works successfully, uh, the plugin tells you how many hours of work time it has saved you. And I am currently in the thousands of hours of work time that it has saved me. And this is um, this is an alternative to Maya's auto recovery or your auto save. Um, what this is actually doing is periodically saving a, uh, a file that just has your animation data on it, right? And so once you open that character again, it will look at your animation and say, this isn't the most up-to-date animation. Do you want me to put the correct curve spec on this? And um, and this is just, you know, uh, uh, think about this. If, if I'm spending, you know, $400 uh, on this a year and this saves me a day's work, it's it's paid for itself almost, right? Like, depending on what your hourly rate is, like, this is a, this is a very worthwhile tool. So, um, again, tools, 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 right? Um, these tools are worth the money, um, and I know that it's hard to justify spending money, um, it's, but it really is worth it. Uh, so what I will say is there's also some tools that, uh, that are just built into the program that you're not, that you're maybe not using, right? There's tools you already have. Um, so let's talk about a couple of those that you may not even, um, be thinking to use or be thinking as, as a way of, of saving you time, right? Um, the, the first is, uh, is the option to, of how we can move keyframes. So by default, this is what, you know, when you grab a bunch of keyframes, moving them looks like, but the move tool has some settings and it'll allow you to change it from a constant move fall off to a linear move fall off, which will allow you to kind of blend your curves or, or sculpt the curves a little bit. Um, now this is, uh, where I found this primarily most useful is um, let's say you, you have a, an attack animation and um, and it starts and ends at, at an idle pose and has a, you know, you've polished it. It looks really great. And, uh, and then uh, you have to change the idle pose for some reason, right? Um, what you can do is just change the, the pose at the beginning and the end, and then use this fall off to kind of blend the keyframes that exist in and out of that. And of course, um, Animbot has some other similar tools, but just being able to recognize that this is a, a simple setting to change inside of Maya that may save you like a lot of time editing every one of those individual keyframes, right? Um, a tool that I think is this is built into to Maya and, and most other animation programs that I think a lot of uh, animators are underutilizing is animation layers. Um, so just to kind of see quickly the the power of animation layers, um, this is a, a, a walk cycle on a cat that I did for the Peace Island game, um, which is actually. Uh, there's a Patreon for uh, for supporting that if you're interested. It's basically just a game about being a cat on an island. Um, the internet loves it. So uh, animation layers, um, I can just grab uh, these controllers and make a second layer. And just by setting one keyframe, it, it changes the entire animation. But it's non-destructive. So if I just disable that animation or disable that layer, now... Um, you know, now that animation is uh, is back to the uh, to its original settings, and um, basically what it is is an entire set of timeline or an entire new timeline that is additive on top of your other timeline, right? So I can blend in to that that walk, right? And there are so many um, there are so many uses for animation layers, and, and I think this is why I encourage people to at least try them is because you will find new places to use them. Um, I was working with uh, University of North Carolina, uh, uh, the, um, the Keenan Flegler uh, College of Business um, on a VR project that they had and or that they were, they were creating. And this was about Ernest Shackleton, who is uh, an Arctic explorer um, who uh, him and his entire crew got trapped in the ice um, in, in the Arctic. And um, and he is a a, uh, a model of 
uh, good leadership, right? Because he managed to, they were stranded for like nine months and he managed to get them all back alive. Um, so the College of Business was creating a simulator where you could sort of be part of that expedition and see some of the, the leadership decisions he made. Um, and so this uh, project involved a lot of character animation where the characters were talking in order to deliver um, information about the game, right? Uh, so I'm gonna have to make some changes here really quick so you can hear it, but I'm gonna play one of those animations for you. Uh, in order for you to hear it though, my microphone will stop working for a second. So just uh, bear with me. I'm going to switch over here and I'll, I'll play one of the animations for you. And uh, here we go. Not much has changed since we've been stuck. We still have two powerful ice flows pressing up against the bow of the Endurance. But the real problem is the third flow pressing up against our starboard hull. If the pressure keeps up there, it'll split the hull wide open and she'll sink. The weather's a bit warmer today. We could double our efforts and try and salvage the ship. Or we can offload as many supplies as we can. What are your orders, Captain? Okay. Um, hopefully you can hear me again now. Um, so <laughs> that animation is uh, over 30 seconds long. Um, and like, you know, this is not um, an animation that requires a lot of acting. Like on, on some level, this is an information dump that is coming from a character, right? Um, and there were a lot of animations in this project that were that long. Um, and a 30 second animation, like, you know, Typically, I, I would imagine that that would take me a month to animate, right? <laughs> and this had dozens of animations that were this long or longer. Um, so I had to come up with a creative solution on how to animate these, uh, these, these sequences faster, right? Um, here's what I came up with. Um, so I created a base idle animation that was reusable for all of the animations. So it's just the character alive, right? Yeah, he, we can tell he's not frozen, he's not dead, he's not paused, right? Um, it's just some keep alive animation on a layer. And then um, by adding an additional layer, um, I could I could put in gestures, right? And these were, you know, somewhat reusable, but really they were just a limited number of keyframes that were on the character's arms and head, maybe a little bit on the spine. Um, from there, I could add in a layer of eyebrow um, animation Right? Uh, just to kind of give some emotion to the upper part of the face. Uh, the upper part of the face uh, carries a lot of the emotion um, of a scene. And then uh, kind of a more simple lip sync layer uh, that's just on the mouth. Now, what this meant is if I wanted to, I could pretty much completely reuse entire sections of this animation at different parts. If I liked a hand gesture from one animation, I could copy those keyframes and just go slap it on another animation. And sort of by keeping these compartmentalized, I was able to animate, I think it was five characters who um, each had no less than, um, than probably, well, most of them had somewhere between uh, probably two to three minutes worth of animation each on them. Uh, one, one or two characters only had maybe like a minute of animation on them. And I was able to get that done in, in probably about three to four months. Um, now, I will say this is not... Uh, showcase animation. This is not the, you know, the best acting of, of animations, but that was not necessarily the purpose of these animations either, right? So animation layers were really just a tool that I was able to use to, as an alternative to motion capture, right? We, we didn't have um, the ability to go motion capture all of these characters saying their lines, um, but we were able to get an okay amount of animation or a very significant amount of animation done pretty quickly. Um, so uh, a couple of other things I, I kind of wanted to talk about um, because this is kind of getting into how we mix all of this together, right? Um, so I think a big issue or a big time sink in animation is, um, is secondary action and overlapping action, right? Um, I mean, it adds so much charisma and style to your animation, right? But it, it also makes this stuff take so much time, right? Um, and so I'm going to talk about a couple of plugins that you can use that, um, that both paid and free that are going to uh, go a long way of speeding this up. Um, 
so uh, there's a handful of them. Uh, most of these you can find on Gumroad. There's Overlapper. Uh, there's a, a set of tools called Reparent, uh, TB Overlap. And, and one of the ones I use quite a bit is LM Spring 2. And LM Spring 2 is free. Um, so I'll show you very quickly what LM Spring does. Um, I just have some, some base animation on this control underneath this hierarchy of, of cubes. So we start with, um, with some motion. We, we select the hierarchy and we create a target locator. And this is kind of like what this hierarchy is, is loosely looking at, right? And what the uh, script will do is create a springy effect. Um, and, and so you can alter this to a point. You can add more or less overlap to um, the animation. Uh, once you're done with that, you can bake that out, and it bakes um, a simulation of this out to every one of those joints. And if you notice, it's baking it out to an animation layer, right? Which means I can turn that on and off, or I can blend in or out of it, or I could do another animation layer on top of it, right? There's just a lot we could do um, with these animation layers now. And so this is a very quick way of getting like, you know, maybe like a, some fabric on, on some, some of the clothes that just needs to bounce a little bit, or maybe some hair, right? Um, so this is all kind of leading into um, to this guy here, Richard Lico. And I don't know Richard. I wish I did. Um, uh, he's, he is absolutely brilliant. He, uh, he worked on Destiny as an animator, and um, now he owns his own studio uh, where he's making his own uh, VR, uh, VR games. Um, and he became the obsession of a lot of animators because he gave uh, several talks, uh, I think some at GDC, a couple, of, a couple of other places, about his process. And I strongly recommend you look him up. Like, he animates differently than any other animator I've ever seen in my life. Um, I'm not going to do this justice, but I'll try to loosely explain it. Um, so... Um, Again, this is Richard's idea, so I'm not trying to take any credit for this. So um, if you do want to learn more about them, though, he offers a whole training course on how to build scripts in order to, to work with a similar workflow as him. Um, and I, I just from understanding how he's working, uh, utilize some of these techniques as well. So, so basically, creatures are made up of interconnected parts, right? So... Um, after you create motion on one part of a creature or, or, or a person or in, anything living, right? Um, once you create that motion on one part of the body, that motion can be reused on other parts of the body or even used to generate motion for other parts of the body, right? He calls this space switching. And what it does is it utilizes local space animation to create world space animation data, now, I know that sentence probably didn't make sense at all. Let me show you what I'm talking about, though. Um, so we have this, this sphere that's moving, right? Um, and it's just some translate and some rotation data, right? But if I parent this locator to it, now that locator is going to move in a very specific way, right? Um, and if I were to constrain this ball to the locator and then bake the keyframes onto that ball, then um, watch this here. So we're going to bake all of the keyframes for the location onto that ball. Now I now I have animation on that ball that is not dependent on the hierarchy. I can delete the locator it was constrained to. I can even delete the original ball. That ball now moves in a very specific way. Right, and that uh, that animation ball is not dependent on the locator of the spiky ball or anything to do with the hierarchy. It's motion in world space, not motion because of relative space rotation. Hopefully, that <laughs> I know that's that's cramming a lot into like a sentence, but um, go back and watch it on like 0.5 speed. Um, so he has a, a whole series of lessons on on how to use this um, in order to solve animation problems. And he just, he can create some beautiful animations in, in ways that um, that make us realize that our workflow is often dependent on our, our, uh, our tools and the rigs, right? He's working sort of independently of the rig. So to kind of show you loosely how this, this might be useful, right? 
is I have some body animation on this character. And it's, it's some very simple motions, um, but there's no keyframes on her head. Um, so if I just grab her head and I use this, um, I, I can get some, uh, some reactive animation on her head now, right? And when she moves, now her head will kind of react to her body. Now it's not perfect, but it's getting me animation data to start working with, right? And the point behind this is to generate motion rather than manually make it all, like to make all of it yourself keyframe by keyframe. Um, and so if you look at motion capture as a tool, it's just motion data that is generated, right? And the animator alters it to get the performance they want. But you know, the motion is generated usually without much input from the animator. I mean, maybe they're there at the motion capture shoot, but they're only able to alter what the, the data that they have. This is a way of generating parts of the animation data while setting at your desk. The animator can have a, a larger level of control on how that animation is or how that data is created. Um, so once that data is created, you got to realize that Maya has a very simple way of reusing some of this. We can just copy and paste keyframes from one object to another, right? If I have like some some very simple like uh, motion on the character's root, I can copy those keyframes and just paste that onto the character's spine. Right? And once I have that data on the spine, then I can alter it to to be what I want, right? I can I can um, shift it in the timeline, and I can have it happen a little bit later. Um, I can make it bigger. Right? My, my rotation X is the forward and backward motion on the spine. So if I scale this up and down, right, it's going to make that that's going to make that uh, that motion on the spine bigger. Or, and this is something people forget, I can invert that. I can scale it to an inverse number, and now my my spine is actually doing the opposite. And forward and backward rotation is what my hips are doing, right? Um, so um, I know we're, we're kind of getting close here. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, um, and sort of start to wrap this up here. Again, tools, tips, and tricks. Um, I want to I want to kind of recognize that in 50 minutes, I am not going to be able to address every possible tools, tip, or trick that you, you may want to learn, right? And so this is very important. You need to keep learning, right? Um, by being in this talk, you are off to a great start. Good job. Um, I, I would also recommend um, GDC shares um, all of their, uh, some of their talks and some very popular ones uh, are the animation ticks, uh, tricks of the trade, um, series, which is basically where they get a bunch of animators to rapid fire tricks that they that they use, and they have like a minute or something to talk about each of them. Um, also, watch other people work, steal elements of their workflow, learn new software, learn new skills. And, and I know that that sounds like I'm saying invest a bunch of time in this, and I am. That time is never wasted; it's invested, right? Um, the other thing is keep gathering tools, right? Again, these, these need to be in your toolbox. New plugins pop up every day. Actually, there was a new overlapping action tool that popped up yesterday that I didn't have enough time to put into this talk. Um, so, and when Maya releases a new version, go watch the what's new video, right? The, the point of this is to not stagnate, right? And to always keep taking risks. Like I... Um, uh, one of my my teachers uh, when I was an undergrad, she was a, a figure drawing teacher, uh, would say, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always gotten, right? And so if you want to get something different, do something different. Like try try new things in order to, to make it better. So um, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up there and, and open it up to questions. Again, here's my, my contact information. Um, I got my LinkedIn in here. I got my my personal email. So if you want to contact me about personal stuff or or if you're interested in school stuff with ETSU, I ha have at it. So. Hi there, Greg. Okay, so yeah. it's a uh, Greg Marlowe at gbmarlow at gmail .com. Um, LinkedIn is Greg Marlowe. That's easy to remember. Mm. I. That's love this kind of stuff because <laughs> I am actually a graduate from Animation Mentor. Oh, cool. I, yeah, I graduated. I, name in, I graduated a long in 2011. Um, okay. Man, Maya, the last stuff that I worked on, it was a long time ago, right? But Maya has come so, so far. We, so, we may so have far. been there. 
We may have been there at the same time. I actually, we, we might have been. Well. Yeah. Um, I think I graduated I, in two thousand nine, so I'm, I'm not for sure. So. No, I graduated in. Wait, I have my plaque on the wall. Hold yeah, on. No, I, I always have to look at mine. <laughs> wait, let me let me grab my plaque. Let me grab my plaque. Yeah. You gotta grab it. <laughs> Here it is. Here's my plaque. I don't know if you can nice. see it. Yeah, I got I got one up here too that I can't reach. Yes, <laughs> my yours is a nicer frame though. Oh, let me put my earbuds back on. I, I got. <laughs> and look at everything got all twisted. There we go. Oh uh, yeah, cool. What's up, brother? <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's see. So I was twenty. Where was it? Does this even have the year on it? <laughs> July to July of 2011. Yeah, you're you're probably like right after I left. I'd say. Right, right. That was like back before. Now they have all these cool models and and a bunch of different stuff instead of just the uh, little. I can't remember what that character is, but Sweet. this stuff is always fascinating. And just the steps that the new stuff that came out in Maya, just like um, it, it was crazy. I, I remember. Well, we can we can talk about that stuff. Let's let's field some <laughs> questions, right? We could talk and talk and talk. Um, Sigma for the win says, "I know that you as a 3D animator may not have as much advice for those not working in 3D animation, but I wanted to ask if there are any tips, books, etc., that are helpful in general to an animator." Um, so I, I do have an, an interest in 2D animation. I teach a, a 2D animation class at ETSU. Um, and I, it, I will say that animation is animation. Like really mm -hmm. what, what we're doing is we're crafting motion, right? Uh, we're not necessarily like, it's not, it, we're not just learning to use the software. Like the, you can do that in a, a couple of, a couple of weeks. Like we're, we're learning how to make people believe that, uh, these pixels are alive. Um, I think that the books uh, kind of go across the board. So um, the uh, Animator Survival Kit, mm. uh, Pre Preston Blair's cartoon Drawn animation, to Life. Drawn to Life is great. Yeah, there's um, – and actually uh, Eric Goldberg uh, recently made well, – not too recently, but a few years back had the uh, – uh, I think it's the Character Animation – Crash Course, or, or maybe it's just Animation Crash Course, but er Eric Goldberg's book. Um, and um, I, I mean, I think the Animator Survival Kit is definitely one that everybody kind of needs to have on their shelf to refer to. Like, he just kind of hit all of the important stuff in there as a base reference. Um, I, I would say that's usually more of a starting point than an ending point, though. Um, it's not like it's got the answer to your animation. It's got it's got the uh, starting point for you to start building from. So, yeah, and just like study the fundamentals. That's it. The okay. twelve fundamentals, right? Get better. Yeah. Just do. If you can take a box and then make it like it bounce heavy, bounce soft. If you can do that with a ball, you can do it with a tube. You can just just and start just putting all the fundamentals because believe it or not, you can take just a, a sphere and or a ball, a circle, and it could be super, super, super interesting. Yeah, there's right. a there's a lot of animators who will um, who will start their process that way. They, they they will basically take a you know if your character is kind of tall and thin, they'll take a tall thin cylinder and sort of get their timing and try to get the emotion just out of the way it mm -hmm. moves, and then you can transfer that onto a character, and it all works works well. So. I love animation so much. And I remember when I was really in school and studying that like I could look at a shot, look at him, watch a movie and then be like, oh, the person that animated this also animated this. Right. And then yeah. so I go back and ask the instructor because, you know, one of my instructors. Oh, I forgot his name. Oh, but he worked on Tangled. Right. And so mm -hmm. I would go back and ask him because we were just like frame by frame Tangled. And he's like, oh, yeah, w when you study under the guy that animated mother gothel singing mother knows best you know that's mm -hmm. like oh ah, that's awesome um but yeah so we, i'd go back and ask a bunch of questions like you know uh was did this person animate this shot too because you know people know people know yeah. that stuff okay let's see um how would you go about animating a player character with there, with where there are multiple different sets of animation sets for the character movement, such as running, walking, turning, etc. Um, how would I go about animating? Well, so, <laughs> um, 
I, I'm not sure I understand the question exactly. Like, I think that there's probably not a trick to, there's not really a trick into turning a walk cycle into a run cycle. Like for some of those, you just have to do all of those animations. I, I mm. think every every character though, no matter whether it's, I mean, uh, you know, even if it's just a, a character running, like I, I guarantee you that I run differently than everybody in this room, right? We, mm -hmm. we all we all do um, what we do differently, right? Uh, because of who we are, uh, whether it's physical reasons, whether it's uh, um, personality reasons, and so I think understanding who that character is or, or who you how you want to portray that character, you know, a character running into a a, a Indiana Jones like trap, right? Um, I, if, if Indiana Jones is going to run into that differently than, um, you know, than Woody Allen. Right. And, and so that is, that is a lot about it first is understanding who that character is. So. I, I think what I kind of feel like the question is like, so you're, you're, let's say you're playing a first person or uh, you're playing a third person game. The character has different sets of animation and you're keyframing mm -hmm. them all. Like, how do you get them to join together? You have oh, to have okay. like a base pose that they all hit at one point. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So usually there's a, a home base or a home pose or like a, an idol, but um so there's a, there's a lot to that. And some of it is in, in the engine. Like some of it is like, uh, being able to blend from uh, from a run to a walk, or being able to uh, have your character turn, uh, it's a mix back and forth. But the way I like to think of game animations is um, the character is inside of this capsule, right? And that capsule is what is moving. Your animations are always in place, right? They're always still, and so it's a combination of what is the player going to do to my character versus how is my animation going to play on top of that. And and how how can we like with the with the engine and with the animation make that feel like a believable experience to the player? Um, so you know, some of that is in how you would set that up in Unreal or Unity for uh, it's the state machine or the uh, uh, the decision tree that you're using mm -hmm. for that. And some of it is just um, uh, you know the you know the the uh, uh, the attack animation is going to end and start in your idle pose, right? Um, and so there's a, but there are like blend states and stuff like that that, that allow you to sort of blend between running and walking and, and things like that. And, and you also have to think about that it is in a game, right? Like how we would jump, we would stand and then we'd get high and then we'd squat down and then we would jump, right? But you mm -hmm. can't do that in a game because you press a button, you want the jump to pretty much happen right now. In some mm -hmm. games there are like you press the button and then they jump it, they, they, they uh, anticipate and jump into it. But like if you're playing Fortnite and you press a jump button, that character just like boing bounces in the air and it's not really a realistic kind of jump because right. you can't jump like that. It's like a Bruce Lee punch. How most people, when they punch, they go like this. Bruce Lee just goes straight out, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, okay. the, let's do the uh, opera man because he's asking a Civ 6 question that I think I know the answer to. <laughs> this one right here? Yeah. So... Um, I think what you're saying is like a, a lot of the uh, so some of the expansion packs in, in Civ Six, uh, like New Frontier, and, and some of the other expansions, um, th they are reusing parts of the base uh, animation set. So uh, um, uh, I actually animated uh, uh, Simon Bovier, um, and and he did start with his base set, I think, as Pedro's base set, um, and frankly, that's just a a. Uh, Animation is expensive in terms of time and money that is invested into it. And, you know, a core game usually has a much larger team than um, like an expansion pack. And so uh, the expansions uh, for Civ 6, like I, I did quite a few uh, character leaders for that. Um, so did uh, Heather. Um, oh, I'm forgetting. Uh, uh, I'm forgetting your last name right now. But it was a team of like, basically three people at the most. Um, and so what we did is uh, they would use for the, for a lot of the base set, like the, the yeses, the nos, um, we were using a starting point of previous characters. And then we would, we would sort of alter that to work mm -hmm. with um, the main character, but all of the speaking lines are custom uh, for those. So uh, Simon has, um, you know, like the declare wars and stuff like that. All of those are custom animations. It's just the yeses and the nos and some of the, the poses that are similar. So, 
Right. Well, we have to go because our time is out. But if you'd like <laughs> to hang out in the Discord, are you going to join us on the Discord? Yeah, for more questions? Because sure. you, there's a bunch more questions that we can't answer right now. Go to the Discord, uh, discord.gg slash Indie Game Business. And uh, go head on over to the channel called Post Session Chat. And if you're going to do that, Greg, that would be awesome if you could answer yeah, some cool. questions over there. Sure awesome. Thing. And cool. we have, who do we got coming up next year? Let me pull up my little, my little spreadsheet right here. Massively Multi-Rider Games. Interesting. And that's with uh, Beth, Beth LaPinci. So we'll see you in, in just 30 seconds. Sounds good.